we are now being recorded, which I know a lot of people are keen to have happen. So welcome. My name is Kathy Howery. I am not actually Roy McConnell, as it says, but uh, I'm Kathy Howery, and I'm here um, today on behalf of the uh, provincial low incidence team of the regional collaborative service delivery um, and also online is my colleague Wendy Kwa. So uh, Wendy and I are delighted to have uh, Marianne Romsky and Rose Sepkik. And Rose, I'm always afraid that I'm butchering your name. So uh, forgive me if I if I don't say it correctly. I need to practice. Um, uh, uh, these two um, professors are, are eminent scholars in the area of AAC, and um, they are both from the University of Georgia. Uh, Dr. Sutkik is a distinguished professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Georgia. Dr. Romsky is a Regents Professor in Communication Psychology, Communication Disorders, and is the Dean for Research and Graduate Studies, or at least that's what it says in the book. I'm not sure if you are continue to be Dean, but they both uh, have uh, keep out of trouble. They, uh, with lots being very busy, they are both affiliated with the Center for Research on Atypical Development. They are both active in the uh, uh, world of writing uh, publications, books, and chapters, and as I alluded to, I'm going to put my um, camera on. This is one of the most recent books that I purchased uh, from them, which I highly recommend, Communication Interventions for Individuals with Severe Disabilities, uh, Exploring Research Challenges and Opportunities, and then as any of you who know me might know, this is perhaps my favorite book of all time in terms of AAC, Breaking the Speech Barrier, Language Development Through Augmented Means, and uh, this is Romsky and Zepkik from uh, 1996, I believe. I think that's right. You guys can, yep, 1996. Um, I, so that's the end of me on the camera. Uh, they are both, um, as I said, preeminent scholars. They are ASHA fellows, Isaac fellows, AIDD fellows, members of the National Joint Committee for uh, communica uh, Communication for uh, People with uh, significant disabilities. We've had some people on our webinars that talk about that before. And um, they are definitely widely known and internationally respected. I had the wonderful pleasure. Uh, I don't want to speak to you about that. Who might have to There, thank you. Um, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Marianne and Rose at Isaac in Toronto in um, 2016 and attending their workshop on the AAC myths. And again, as many of you will know, they are the uh, original AAC myth ladies. So um, I could talk about them all day, but that would take too much of the time away from their wonderful talk, which I'm very excited about because this is the first time that we've really touched on um, toddlers and, and uh, really early intervention. And as I hope you all know, the original collaborative service delivery mandate is to serve kids zero to 20. So we're finally getting down to some of the younger ones. And with no further ado, I would like to turn it over to our uh, presenters today. I'm very excited. Thank you for coming. Kathy, this is uh, Rose Sefcik. Welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for that generous introduction. Uh, Mary Ann and I are pleased to uh, uh, try and share some of the work that we've done over the years. So uh, uh, as you've uh, set us up, we're going to plunge right in. On the very first image that you see, um, we feel the need to uh, make sure that you um, have a notion about uh, any disclosures that need to be made. And you can see we are declaring both in the financial and non-financial realms. And uh, we'll leave that uh, for your perusal and move on to the learning objectives uh, for this afternoon's session. So we want to try to tackle several um, specific objectives. First of all, we want to uh, examine the role of receptive and expressive language skills uh, in the early language intervention process. And we want to focus on the importance of speech generating devices uh, in what we like to call augmented language interventions. 
We will describe parents' role in augmented language interventions that we've designed and conducted and talk about the protocols that we've used in those parent coach language interventions. We'll also spend a bit of time talking about the transition from the early intervention period to preschool and uh, underscore and articulate the role of augmented language intervention in the development of speech. So let me continue the introduction to our session today and kind of lay out our sort of uh, approach, if you will. And as you can see, we want to declare AAC, Augmentative and Alternative Communication, as an intervention approach. When you think about AAC, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but feel the need just to touch base to make sure um, we're all talking about the same things. We're really talking about all forms of communication that are available. And typically, you have two sort of large categories, unaided and aided. And in the image before you, you'll see that unaided forms of communication include simple gestures, facial expressions, manual signs, and sign language in various forms. Aided forms of communication, in contrast, are picture communication boards, dedicated computer devices that actually speak words and sentences for its users. And uh, this can range from computer, tablets, and smartphones. So if we talk a little bit more about the early language intervention process and in AAC, we're really talking about individuals, children, for whom these significant delays in communication development are actually impacting all aspects and phases of a child's overall development. The extant intervention research has typically focused on developing spoke, spoken language skills or on teaching so-called pre-linguistic skills. And though, of course, we know that our collective goal is to develop functional, intelligible spoken language, if possible, approaches that focus exclusively on speech can often frustrate the child and his or her family members. And we also know that even with the establishment of a pre-linguistic base of skills, a child with a severe communication disorder may not make that transition to spoken language. So we view early augmented language experience as facilitating all forms of communication, including speech. So uh, Kathy already gave a little bit uh, of an advanced preview here, but as she mentioned, Marianne and I have uh, talked about several of the myths that we feel actually provide, in a sense, kind of barriers towards achieving early intervention using AAC. So we've identified some of them on the screen in front of you. In myth one, we often have experienced, as perhaps you have, the view that AAC is really a last resort to be tried in intervention. We'd like to have people recast that as perhaps the first line of intervention, the first line of defense for children and their families as they're developing their speech and language skills. Myth two is certainly one that we likely collectively have heard more than once. That is, that AAC would hinder or stop further speech development. Certainly our own work and the work of other investigators have put to rest this myth. Myth three sometimes surfaces in the sense that speech generating devices may be considered only for children who have intact cognitive skills. Our work and that of many others indicates that those kinds of cognitive barriers, if you will, are simply that, barriers that people have imposed. Myth four that we've identified here 
is that individuals must be of a certain age in order to benefit from AAC. Kathy made reference to one of our first uh, book volumes, Breaking the Speech Barrier, and in that particular study, the mean chronological age of the participants was 12 years plus. So we can show that well beyond the period of time chronologically that one would expect to see gains, including gains in speech, can be accomplished if youngsters have appropriate experience. So age should not be a barrier as well. And finally, and you'll hear uh, more about this as we progress in the webinar today, that parents simply have difficulty using speech generating devices, so we can't have them be involved in that. So in this clinical research program that we'll detail in the rest of our hour today, uh, we note that we have been funded by the United States uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, specifically the institute that focuses on deafness and, and other communication disorders, and also uh, the Institute of Education Sciences. <coughs> For successful programs, as I know you know, because of the environment that you work in, it literally takes a village, and uh, several of the people who have worked with us are identified on this screen. <clears throat> so, Let's talk about the early language intervention studies that we're going to underscore for you today. We're basically going to be talking about two main studies. Uh, in study one, we examined the effects of three parent-implemented language interventions, one that focused exclusively on spoken language skills, and two that had forms of augmented language skills on the development of vocabulary learning, both in the spoken domain and the augmented domain, for 62 toddlers and their parents. And the toddlers were, perhaps not surprisingly, 24 to 36 months of age chronologically. We'll also talk about study two, where we attempted to study more about the effects of intervention and the pieces that are most effective in producing communication outcomes. And here we compared the effects of two parent-implemented augmented language interventions, again, looking at toddlers' spoken and augmented language learning. In this study, 51 toddlers participated, as well as their parents, and again, they were 24 to 36 months of age. So let's talk a little bit more. The intervention that we uh, have designed and conducted these studies with, you see the chronological age, and I've mentioned it, but let's talk about uh, more characteristics of the participating toddlers. So for youngsters to participate in this study, they had a vocabulary of at most 10 intelligible words. Using the Mullen scales of early learning, they would have produced a score of less than 12 months on its expressive language scale. The toddlers would need to demonstrate at least some form of primitive intentional communication ability, and they also needed to have upper extremity gross motor skills that allowed them to select the symbols on the speech generating device. These youngsters had a primary disability other than delayed speech or language impairment or deafness or hearing impairment. And if we combine the total number of participants from study one and study two, we're talking about 113 toddlers in these two studies. So what questions were we interested in? What questions were we trying to ask? The first one actually evokes a little bit of that myth that we have been working on knocking down. Namely, can parents and, inter and interventionists implement these types of interventions? And importantly, 
when parents are implementing them, does it result in child language gain? So now we're going to detail aspects of the intervention as we carried it out. The intervention framework focused on both input and output strategies, and they always occurred within naturalistic teaching routines. We want to note that in study one, as I had alluded to earlier, we had one condition where it was a spoken intervention only. So by that we mean no use of a speech generating device, simply using spoken language. We followed a specific parent coaching protocol and it included observation, parent coaching during intervention, and then transfer to the home communication environment. The details of each of these uh, in intervention types across the two studies are going to be detailed by my colleague, Mary Ann Romsky. And so I will turn over the reins of this webinar to her. Mary Ann? Thanks, Rose. Hi, everyone. Um, so Rose said that we have two studies, and what you see here in this uh, particular slide is the different interventions that were used in both studies. SCI is the spoken intervention alone. And you can see that that has no use of a speech generating device. ACI was augmented communication input, and that uh, approach used a speech generating device to provide communication input to the child, but the child was not required to produce symbols on the device. But the symbols were available to the child, and if they did use it, they were um, reinforced appropriately for their use. In ACO, which you'll see was used in both study one and study two, the child uses the SGD to communicate. And the interventionist and the parent, IMP, encourages and prompts the child to produce communication using the device. Used only in study two, and you'll see why this is the case as we talk about the findings from each of the studies, um, is ACIO, which is a hybrid intervention combining input and output. And this is for Kathy. Going back to breaking the speech barrier, ACIO is really the SAL uh, from the old um, Breaking the Speech Barrier book. Uh, ACIO combines input and output. So the interventionist and the parent models uh, vocabulary uh, for the child using the device. Symbols are positioned in the environment, and they also encourage and prompt the child to use the device. Uh, so those are the four uh, different variations of intervention. One of them used in study one alone is spoken only, and that's used as a contrast to the augmentation. And you'll see why that's really important as we talk about the findings. And then ACIO, ACI, and ACO used in study one. So those are three interventions in study one. And then in study two, and overlap ACO with ACIO. So no matter what intervention the child was in, the intervention protocol was comparable. It was 12 weeks or 24 sessions, uh, which you'll also note is a relatively focused period of time. Nine weeks or 18 sessions occurred in our lab. Families came to the lab for the intervention. Um, and then three weeks, the last six sessions, were generalization to the child's home. So we brought the intervention home, which is where it would be used uh, for the majority of time after the protocol was completed. All sessions were 30 minutes apiece and they were divided into three 10-minute blocks of three activities, play, book reading, and snack. And that was that was 
we wanted activities that would focus on. Um, Hello. Can you please mute? Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we're back. Uh, so back to the 30 minute sessions. There were three 10 minute blocks of play, book reading, and snack. And that was so that it would um, mimic, so to speak, activities that parents would typically do with their child at home. It could also expand to uh, mealtime activities beyond snack. Uh, but those were the three 10-minute blocks that we had. And there was an individualized like, vocabulary for each activity. The parent training focus was set up uh, that the first four weeks or eight sessions of intervention, the parent observed with the speech language pathologist in um, the uh, adjoining observation room, and you'll see a photograph of that shortly. Um, the parent had a protocol manual with weekly materials that they received from us. You'll also see that. And beginning in the fifth week, parents backed into the session with ongoing coaching by the interventionist. The three 10-minute blocks did not vary. They were always play, book reading, and snack. And the backing in always went snack, book reading, play for the parent. And that was so the parent didn't have to leave uh, after the snack activity. Beginning in the eighth week, the parent led the session and was the main implementer. Um, the target vocabulary selection. So prior to the first session, the speech language pathologist and the parent worked together to choose target vocabulary. We chose six target words for each context, play, book, reading, and snack. It was a combination of nouns and core vocabulary, core being my turn, all done, more, what's this, there was an overlap of core vocabulary across each context. And quite importantly for our results, the child did not comprehend or produce the target vocabulary word prior to the intervention. And then we used Mayor Johnson board, making, board maker symbols to represent the target vocabulary. We uh, had measures of target vocabulary development, which was the key variable that we were interested in seeing whether there was change in. And we did that with transcripts of the intervention sessions. Um, and target vocabulary use was coded to quantify its use in terms of number of target vocabulary words used spontaneously. Um, and that was critical to what you'll see at the end. These are all spontaneous use by the child. Um, the mode of communication used by the child when we looked at the transcripts uh, for expressing the target vocabulary word, it was coded is either as an augmented word, meaning it, appear, it was a symbol use, a spoken word that the child produced it, or they produced the spoken word, and they use the augmented word. Um, the intervention strategies we used during the sessions were creating communication opportunities, and these are all things that uh, many people use uh, in intervention sessions, and we used a range of them with uh, children. Uh, one, provide choice for the child, and these were the things we were teaching the parents to do create communication opportunities, and communicate with the child. So creating opportunities, provide choices, sabotaging the environment, giving small amounts so the child would have to make more requests, briefly delaying access, using pause time, and using fill-in-the-blank activities. In terms of communicating with the child, we looked at using parallel talk, using short, simple sentences, 
limiting questions using keywords, slowing their rate of speech, immediately responding to the child's communication attempt, following the child's lead, and most importantly, having fun with the child, making it a positive experience. In terms of the parent coaching, I want to talk just a little bit about the things we did with our parents. Um, first of all, we kept a very positive attitude with our parents. We were not negative with them of things they couldn't do or didn't do at the start. Um, we presented um, information in a manner that fits the parent's learning style. So we did verbal and or written feedback. We did demonstration and modeling. And at the end of sessions, we did videotape review. We gave specific and concrete examples of what things a parent could do. We built feedback around what was needed most to support the child's progress and have the parent be able to implement the intervention with the child. We followed a consistent format at the end of each session when we were, we were reviewing the session. We asked the parents what they thought about the session. We gave positive feedback first. We identified and gave feedback in primary areas of needed support, and then identified and gave feedback on secondary areas if it was needed and warranted. We asked the parent if they had questions, and then we summarized with positive comments. And we did that for every session so that the parent knew what the, they also knew what the routine was as they were going through it. Um, and the areas in which we provided coaching were creating a context for conversation, how the augmented protocol itself, how we did it uh, with the child in the 30 minutes, that we did the 10 minutes and 10 minutes and 10 minutes. We actually used a timer that went off so that the parents knew when 10 minutes were up so they could switch the activity. Uh, we talked about modeling language. We talked about the ability to create communication opportunities, both in choice making or setting up the environment. We talked about the child's performance. We also talked about behavior management issues, how you might redirect or motivate the child, deal with transitions that might be difficult for a child. And then we also discussed interaction style, for example, directive or passive, in terms of how the parent was interacting with the child. And we provided coaching in those various areas, which varied slightly across parents, but uh, those were all the areas we worked in. And here you can see a picture of um, a parent uh, working with the speech-language pathologist. That happens to be Andrea Barton Halsey. Uh, and um, then in the, through the window behind, uh, you see our interventionist working with the child. Uh, so um, we, this also gives you some examples of um, the weekly goals we set. Every week, the parent got uh, a paper uh, to add to a, a binder that we had um, that uh, focused on what the goals were for the week. And here you can see it's week five, and this is in the ACIO condition. We had tar child targets, parent targets, interventionist targets, and then a look ahead for what the following week would look like for them. Uh, and we had this for each type of the four different interventions. Uh, and um, the parent received this and then kept it, so they had it for the week going forward. We gave, this is an example of some of the individualized written feedback. Again, this is for the ACIO condition, and it uh, talks about what the parent had done, what they did well, how they did it, and gave them some ideas for future uh, directions um, so that they had something to take away with them. Uh, one thing we didn't say was in the beginning was that one reason why we started in our lab and then went home 
was in some of our pilot work, our parents felt very strongly that it was very difficult for them to implement the intervention starting at home, that there were too many things like other little kids tugging at their legs, um, the phone ringing, somebody ask, another child asking for help. And so when they came to the lab, we provided childcare for the uh, family. So if they brought another child with them, somebody was taking care of the child so that they could focus their attention on observing their child at first and then moving into the intervention um, sessions and really focus on that. And our feedback from the parents was that uh, that was very helpful to them and that when we did take it home, they already knew what they were doing and how they were doing it. And so it was more about transitioning to home rather than starting out. So I'm going to talk just briefly about the clinical research outcomes from the study. And um, Rose talked about what our questions were. So first question is, can parents implement these interventions? And um, parents with at least a high school education were able to implement the features of the intervention to which they were assigned. And it was the inter implementing the augmented interventions was no more difficult than implementing the oral language intervention. Parents appeared to implement all interventions equally well. So regardless of which um, condition, which group they were assigned to, they um, were able to uh, implement the intervention and all the pieces of it. Now, probably the most important thing is does parent implementation result in child language gain? And the answer is a resounding yes. And um, the children showed gains in target vocabulary use as augmented and spoken words. But there were differences across the condition. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the findings in study one and then study two. In study one, ACI and ACO provided a way for the child to communicate via the visual graphic symbols and digitized words after only nine weeks of intervention. So that's 18 sessions. And remember that these are children with pretty significant disabilities, all with less than 10 spoken words, most with no spoken words to start. ACIO and to a much lesser extent ACI were interventions that substantially increased the likelihood that the children with these profiles would produce spoken words after nine weeks of parent-implemented intervention, as opposed to the spoken condition alone. So what we found was that the augmented output condition was better than the augmented input condition, which was actually not what we hypothesized. Um, but that's another story. Uh, and um, both of them were better than spoken intervention alone. And the use of the SGD contributed positively to the intelligibility of child communication. Uh, so the children in the augmented conditions in study one did far better in terms of target vocabulary use, spontaneous target vocabulary use, than the children in the spoken language condition. And I'm going to show you a graph uh, in a little bit from both studies that will show you just how much difference. Um, it's quite striking. In study two, what we did was take ACO, which was um, the uh, output condition and the best condition in study one, and compare it to a hybrid which combined ACO and ACI together. So that's why we have ACIO. Um, and we did that because even though ACI uh, wasn't as strong as ACO, it was still much better than spoken alone. And so ACIO in some sense, not surprisingly, the hybrid provided the strongest use of augmented and spoken words. Um, so pulling it together, 
was really uh, what gave the best um, outcomes for the child in terms of vocabulary uh, acquisition. And we also included in study two something that we called a waitlist control. And that was where children, half of the children started immediately when they came into the project, and half of them waited three months before they started, which was the length of the intervention. And what we found is that if they, during that three month period, they did not develop expressive communication skills. So we feel comfortable saying that they don't develop the skills without intervention. And the other issue in study two that comes out uh, is that the role of receptive language skills at the onset of intervention probably needs some more attention. And that's something we're working on right now. Uh, and this next slide is a figure that shows you uh, the vocabulary, functional vocabulary size. So children learned um, up to, you'll see the graph, it goes from zero to 20 vocabulary items. And uh, on the left side of the screen is spoken communication. And you can see that children on average learned one word. If you look at ACO, if we read left to right, ACO in study one, they learned 15 um, vocabulary words. And you can see, if you look down on each bar, the top part is spoken only. The middle bar, part of the bar is both spoken and augmented. And the lower part of the bar uh, is augmented only. Um, in uh, ACO in study two, almost as good as what it was in study one. Um, and ACI, you can see, still much, much better than spoken alone. Um, but none of them as good as spoke as ACIO, which is the combination that gets you almost uh, to 20 symbols. Um, it's 20 words that the vocabulary words that the children are learning. So that gives you the sense of what they learned uh, through the study, and it compares both studies. Uh, so total, you're looking at 113 children's uh, response to the intervention. I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, clinical implications, clinical applications of this, and talk just about some strategies that we think are important based on what we've learned and what others in the literature speak about. Um, one, um, we are really strong proponents of beginning AAC intervention early and to integrate AAC strategies into early language intervention as opposed to using AAC as a last resort. Uh, we began the early intervention work after one of the parents in our earlier SAL study said to us about her 19-year-old son, if I knew he could do this when he was two, I would have treated him differently. And it really um, spoke to us about the need to uh, begin early. And this parent encouraged us strongly to work with very young children and try to look at what changes could be made when you started early. Uh, the second thing here is integrating AAC intervention into natural settings, using existing routines and activities, using the child's own toys and books and other motivating items for them, uh, so that it isn't a pull-out kind of model where uh, children are taking out of the routines, but really trying to keep those routines um, as a uh, anchoring point for adding in the intervention. And um, some more general early interventionists like Julianne Woods has talked about routines and the use of routines in intervention. Providing training and education to communication partners, acknowledging families' pre-existing values, their perspectives and their experiences that they bring, uh, and really trying to work with 
how they view things and what they're doing as they uh, move through an intervention. Considering individual learning styles and providing feedback appropriately, really looking at how the children as well as the parents are learning uh, and looking at what kind of feedback is most helpful to them. Individualizing services and supports, making individual decisions regarding vocabulary for each child, and choosing activities and materials that motivate and interest the child. And then integrating AAC within systematic language-based instruction. And um, we really see the use of um, speech generating device as a tool within language intervention and um, really using routines and functional environments to build language skills using the AAC tool. Selecting relevant vocabulary, considering the child's motivation, as well as family routines and developmental appropriateness, and also then thinking about number and arrangement of vocabulary and word types, and those are a range of issues that start to get more complicated as the child begins to develop more uh, vocabulary words. And one that's really important to us is allowing ample time for intervention success, not giving up too soon, uh, consistently implementing the same strategies week after week, and documenting progress over time. Sometimes you have children who um, sort of get it right away and figure out that this symbol goes with this spoken word and other children need time before they get there. Uh, and sometimes I think we all too often switch to a new activity or a new strategy before we give a strategy time to succeed and uh, looking at how much time a child needs to be able to get there. And it's different for every child. Then monitoring AAC intervention programs over time, establishing formal and informal ways of gaining information from family members, such as journals, emails, teleconferences, um, e even thinking of web-based ways that might be able to go back and forth to monitor progress and monitor, uh, provide supports to a family, and adding new vocabulary as needed uh, over time. So the, the issue that uh, then we uh, came to is we were dealing with uh, young children who were um, in, in the United States in early intervention and in the States early intervention goes zero to three and at three they transition to preschool. So our intervention was really set up so that we got them when they were in early intervention. In Georgia, it's called Babies Can't Wait. Um, and um, then they transitioned to a preschool, which was now a different service delivery system and um, different uh, professionals working within that system. And uh, this was a real challenge for us uh, we think the same intervention principle should apply when you transition to preschool. You should use a consistent AAC intervention strategy, overlay it with consistent language and communication strategies, provide choices, provide modeling, give pause time, add individualized vocabulary for the child, and now there would be new vocabulary for a preschool environment. Um, and again, use the device during consistent routines. And really, the biggest um, difficulty and the biggest hurdle for us was training and educating these new communication partners. It was no longer just the parents, but the teachers and the SLPs and the teacher's aide and the bus driver and all the other people who were involved with the child. We often faced um, SLPs, which distressed me greatly, and teachers who would say, no, that child can't do that. 
um, you could just do it with them because it was research. Uh, and that would um, be very frustrating for us. Uh, so one thing we're very um, focused on is trying to figure out how to get uh, the preschool teachers more in line with what's happening in early intervention. Um, but we think the same kind of strategies apply. You might change the routines and change the vocabulary, but you're still going to be providing the same kinds of activity, uh, you know, activities and language-based uh, strategies that you would uh, in early intervention. And I would say this, we're still working on this preschool transition stuff. Let me summarize, and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. Um, children between the ages of two and three clearly can benefit from a systematic AAC parent coach language intervention model. Um, parents play a critical role in their child's communication development, and especially if they're given systematic coaching and support to help them uh, as they try to uh, develop the best strategies for use with their child. I think this, the next uh, comment here is one that Rose talked about when she was talking about myths, and we talked about in terms of the data that we have, but AAC does not hinder speech development. In fact, our data strongly suggests that it helps speech development, and in fact, it probably helps it more than focuses that are on speech alone or oral language alone. Uh, so we feel very strongly that the whole idea that the myth of you shouldn't do this because it's going to hinder speech is definitely not true for young children. Um, and uh, our data clearly support that. The next is the importance of not just the expressive language, but also receptive language to AAC intervention. And here, this is an area where we are we are really focused on working um, moving forward. We really are looking to try to uh, distinguish different strategies, whether that ACI strategy might be better for children who are very low comprehenders to begin with, and that they might do better, do even better with a, a strategy that starts out with uh, input and goes to output, uh, so sequ sequenced. Um, but we're working on that right now and trying to um, look at that. But we really think that receptive language is a very important part of early AAC intervention. We also think that the components of this framework may be used broadly in a variety of clinical and home-based settings uh, so that there's applicability to a wide range of um, uses. And we say thank you uh, for listening to us as we went through this, and we're happy to take questions or uh, talk more about uh, some of the study. So thank you. Thank you, Marianne and Rose. That was wonderful. And Natalie writing down some notes. And um, it's lovely to see Sal um, reinvented and stronger than ever. <laughs> my um, so there have been, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, there have been a few questions that have been posted. Okay. So I will um, speak to those first. I do have some thoughts as well. but. Okay. Um, so, um, or some things that I want to ask you. Um, from one question is about your symbol layout. What type of symbol layout do you use? Core with fringe, and I think you talked about that a little bit, but maybe you could address it a little bit more specifically. And did you address the number of symbols available based on the child, or was it pretty consistent for every child, like across children? So the symbol layout was, um, so when these studies were both conducted, it was before, um, and you could see that in some of the photographs, before we had iPads. Um, so they were not dynamic displays. Um, so we had symbols 
up for each routine. We basically had a page for each routine, and um, we had a mix of uh, core vocabulary that went across uh, the three activities and then activity uh, vocabulary specific to the activities. The core vocabulary items always appeared in the same location. We did not move symbols around uh, during the intervention. Um, and the number of symbols, that was the second part. I was trying to remember what it was. Um, so in terms of the number of symbols, we started out with a consistent number for everybody, and that was about 16 symbols that they had. And uh, across the three um, routines. Um, but some children uh, learn those symbols and use them spontaneously uh, very quickly. And so if the child demonstrated spontaneous use over multiple sessions, we added symbols. Um, so in the end, I'd have to go back to the uh, original uh, paper, the JSLHR paper, but um, there was a range of number of symbols that were on the device um, at the end of the 12 weeks, uh, even though they all started with the same number at the beginning. Okay. So I'm going to then um, ask, uh, sort of do a follow-up question to this question before I go to the next one that's in the chat. Uh, because you alluded to the idea that this is before iPads. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we uh, comes up a lot is that people say, oh, they're not ready for, they're, you're overwhelming them with symbols if you give them what, what sort of, I guess, is called, in quotes, a robust language system. Given the iPad world that we're in now, what, do you want to comment on would you do it differently? Would you give them something that had a more robust prepackaged language system, or would you still keep it relatively small number of, of words, symbols going in? I think we would keep it as a small number of symbols going in. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, clearly some children moved on to have more symbols, but I I think it would depend on the routine. I wouldn't put more on there given the given these children who are at the very, very beginning stages of language development, um, of word development. Uh, I would not go with more symbols at the beginning. I would build slowly. Interesting. Um, but I wouldn't build with one symbol, um, only because the other thing we found in other studies we've done has been that um, you need a set of, you need a set of mixed set of symbols, not just nouns, mm -hmm. uh, to really um, give the child an opportunity to perhaps enhance their language development as they moved along. So, um, Interesting. Good. We would also mix up, we would also give a range of type of word yeah. on the uh, display. So not just noun, noun boards that we used to. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kathy, back in the day when we stuck to the point addables because we thought, okay, we know how to handle that. Most importantly, we know how to assess it. Yeah. We did not see spontaneous combinatorial symbol use until we had different classes of words. And then it just popped right out as if the kids were waiting to do it, but we weren't smart enough because we were so busy being conservative in terms of what we could assess and do. Interesting. So stuck. that's lovely. That's a lovely quote. I, I may want to, and other people on this may want to talk to you more about um, restricting symbols. I have some thoughts, but I, I have, there's more questions here, so I want to make sure that I honor people. People ask lots of questions, so this has been a very positive, um, a very positive uh, a talk because you've, you've got lots of um, thoughts coming. So um, one is, I think, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit easy. Um, any parent-friendly resources or websites 
for parents who need encouragement to use AAC to reassure them <laughs> that uh, AAC does not hinder speech development. Maybe your little paper that's out there in the world. <laughs> um, it, the only website that I can think of that they could go to is the NJC website. Yeah. Um, so our we don't have a website that talks about this, though we probably should. Um, and it probably should be on our list of things to do. But uh, the, um, the NJC website talks about this issue specifically under uh, some questions and areas for discussion that, that would be really good. It's a, a user-friendly site. It would be very user-friendly for parents. And it is www.asha.org. NJC. Right. And I'll send that out to everyone as well. Okay, great. We, we did have Amy Goldman um, talk to um, your collective wonderful work on the uh, new Communication Bill of Rights. So, right. you know, we have had a few uh, pointers in that direction, but I'll make sure that everyone gets, and that's a great idea. But I also do love the idea that you might add that to in your, in your spare time, build your own website. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Great idea. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, next question. For children who do try to talk but have very low intelligibility, I can see that AAC and speech support would work well jointly. Would you choose only AAC vocabulary that the child cannot, and they sort of put it in quotes, um, say intelligible, in, you know, like that, intelligibly? Um, it's a really good question. So. Our kids weren't like that, but I would say we have some other experience with in a the pilot work to this work that we did. Um, we had a a little preschooler um, who uh, started using uh, the device and then became intelligible had uh, spoken words that were intelligible, and basically she stopped using the symbols for those words. Interesting. And what we did was add new words that she didn't say, um, and we also, in, she wound up having a lot of single word vocabulary, and we then used the device to help her combine words and, and get combinatorial utterances and as she did that then we reduced the use. So um, so I would say that if they have a spoken word that is intelligible, they probably don't need to use the device for it and it could be used to uh, give them support for words they're not producing. Um, I think the other thing, were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say, I think it sounds like a, a a really good strategy. We're being careful in what we say because we have not tested that out, but it sounds very reasonable of support some, let the other ones go, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I would anticipate that, as Mary Ann's saying, as the youngster makes further progress, you're kind of boosting the vocabulary uh, using that approach. Yeah, and I, I think the the other thing is, I think there are some, uh, I've heard some other people out there talking about how you should combine, the com combining a, an approach to get better intelligibility with uh, AAC. And, one of the things that we saw, this is not in the cobbler work, but with our SAL work uh, from a number of years ago now, that one of the things the device did was give the child a consistent model of how the word was produced. And um, that helped the child be able to say the word. So, um, there really could be some interesting work on how to uh, combine those two things. And um, I, I think it's a great 
great way to think about it. And it's a really good use of AAC as well. AAC doesn't have, it is augmentative and alternative, or alternative and augmentative, just not just one. Uh, it's not just an alternative. It has many uses. And for very young children or children just starting out speaking, it could have that use. Um, and, you know, our view has always been that um, speech is very special, and it is an amazing form of communication. Uh, and, of course, you would want every child to be able to talk. But um, so if you can get more spoken communication, then by using AAC, that's a great uh, additional use of AAC. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a few more questions here. I know it's 4.30, so I do want to honor your time. Um, are you up for a couple more? Sure, sure. Wonderful, okay. So this one I think is, is quite important. Um, they, uh, it was asked, did you run any groups with multiple children, interventionists, and parents, or was it always one family at a time? Uh, we always saw one family at a time. Um, we did not run it with groups. Uh, that would be very interesting to do. We did have groups of, par of the parents come together to meet with us when they finished their um, participation in the study, but it was a one family at a time uh, study. All right. Great, and I, I agree with you. I think it would be interesting to see how it might be adopted. Maybe this will be a point that I'm going to say to those on on our, our session today that might not be working exclusively with families. I mean, everyone is working with families, but what I, a big takeaway that I had from today's talk was how wonderful it would be, and you alluded to doing this with preschool teachers, but so many of our kids, um, in, in Alberta, their their lives are, um, inter, their primary intermediary in school is an educational assistant or a paraprofessional. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think how wonderful if we could do some, I'm going to call mm -hmm. it front end loading with this kind of an approach to educational mm -hmm. assistance, wouldn't our kids have so much more likelihood of success in school? <laughs> that's a great, um, that's a great adaptation of this, because yeah. uh, you also could do it in a way that would be, it's a, it's a limited intervention in that it's not a forever ongoing kind of, I mean, you would move to some other piece to it. So you could do a training like that. And we clearly show that our families could use this. Um, so uh, I, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah. And we always had the idea of taking the preschool piece and uh, adapting it and doing another, we were talking about writing another grant that would let us do that um, in preschools, but doing it with educational aids as the people you're training would be terrific. Mm -hmm. um, Hmm, you might have to talk more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I mean, and I, I, I can hear people's argument, oh, that it would take too much time, but I also want to reiterate, you know, that's time that our kids never get back if we don't. It, well, and it's not really, overall, it's really not that much time. If you right. think it's 24, se we, you have 24 sessions, 30 minutes each, that's, 12 hours. Yeah, it's a pittance of time, really. It's yeah, it's not that much. Um, yeah. And Kathy, you may recall in the original SAL study, we did teach all of the teachers of the That's young kids who mm -hmm. were participating. Mm -hmm. And that extended into school, we did everyone who was in the vicinity, including people like the school bus drivers. Right. So I know it can be done, yep. and actually, as Marianne is saying, with what seems like a more streamlined approach with the toddlers seems very doable. I, I would add one other thing that um, it, this is a going off, it's something we didn't talk about today, but we are working right now um, on 
and are just about finished with it out of the toddler um, protocols and the things we did with parent coaching. Um, we have developed an app that we're getting set to test in South Africa where caregivers and parents don't, um, they get, the child with neurodevelopmental disorders gets 30 minutes of therapy a month at a rural, at a tertiary care hospital. Um, and what we've done is take the protocols and create basically 12 weeks of a protocol for a tablet-based app that they will use. And we're, 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 the app is just about ready, and we're um, just about ready to test it with a, a group of children uh, and a control group. Um, and um, we think this has a more broad applicability and an educational aid um, could listen to it too. It's it's also based on routines, and you'd have to switch the routines. We have sort of home routines like dressing and bathing and eating and um, play, but um, you could have school routines as the routine. Um, anyway, it's an aside, but it's something we're working on that could do that kind of thing. Well, that sounds very wonderful. You'll do it for Africa and for Alberta. So that'll be, thank you. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I'm going to, um, there's a couple of other questions le left, but I think one of the things that I'm going to do just to close it up, because I think you've addressed most of them, is okay. to, um, I'm going to uh, pop over and I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh, um, and I'm going to uh, remind Oops, not that. I'm going to remind folks here that are present that we have the wonderful, oopsie, what am I doing here? Uh, Kathy doesn't even know how to run this. That we have the wonderful opportunity of having uh, Marianne and Rose come to Alberta in May. So if you like what you've heard here this, this afternoon, and I certainly have, I continue to um, be, uh, I told them that I was a bit of a groupie when I saw them in Toronto, I continue to be. Um, we will be having, uh, they will be joining us uh, live face to face um, in Edmonton on May 18th at the university. And that's sort of a, a not sort of as a partnership with the U of A. We're really delighted about that. If you want to register for that, you can go to the Edmonton Regional Learning Consortia. It's $50 for the day. It's a bargain, and you'll get fed on top of that. Um, and if you happen to be in the southerner part of the province, Edmonton is really sort of the middle part, um, after the long weekend, um, they will be in Calgary on May 22nd at the Children's Hospital. Again, thank you very much. Shout out to the Children's Hospital for providing space. And um, uh, again, talking about young children, and we threw the breaking the speech barrier uh, uh, in their <laughs> in their presentation um, uh, because that's ultimately, I think, where what this is all going to. So um, I just wanted to make sure that people were aware. I will send out more information um, to everyone, including some of the things that we I promised uh, today. And I just want to say again, thank you so very much for your wonderful talk. Um, it it was, it was um, most um, uh, insightful and I think hopeful. Um, I, I am struck by your quote that you said about the, the family member or the parent that said, if I knew that he could do this when he was two, I would have tre treated him differently. That almost makes me cry. Um, <laughs> for us to help um, parents and teachers and siblings and everyone see kids differently by providing mm -hmm. them with a voice in the world, um, I think mm -hmm. is absolutely tremendous work. So thank you, thank you, thank for you for the wonderful hour. And I look so forward to seeing you in May. And I promise this, well, I'm just going to say I promise the snow will be gone. I will never promise the snow will be gone. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we hope the snow is gone, but yeah. we're looking forward to it. And we appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we talked about here. And we'll... I have more to say when we come to Alberta. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we will put, have this up um, in a couple of weeks if you want to watch it again, and I know I will. And um, with that, we're going to let these ladies go. It's getting a little bit late in their day. And um, <laughs> thank you again, and we will talk soon. Great. Thank, thank you, Kathy. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye.